You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as uh, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. You, you feel this, this nervousness on the phone there? Sir, I've been trying to make an urgent phone call up there. Well, I don't think it's something I want to do on an overseas phone. You got to make some phone calls. Hang up the phone. Prank caller. Prank caller. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Packernet After Dark call-in show of the Packernet Podcast Network. Please feel free to call in 608-501-0718. Give your thoughts, your feelings, your desires and emotions. New callers go to the front of the line. We do not have any new callers today, so we're just going to kick this thing right off with Andy from Kansas. Hey, Ryan, it's Andy again. Just a few thoughts about the Eagles. Um, right. I've been reading some really good articles on Cheesehead TV, uh, one by Bruce Irons, one by Jersey Al. And they they basically say, you know, the Packers uh, – are certainly are not out of, you know, the planning, the ability to plan and, and to create a good team considering, uh, what the Eagles are. And both those, those articles took on some of the, uh, the wonderings and complaints about Packers fans, such as, you know, do they draft well enough? Well, I mean, the Eagles won it in 2017, were 4, 11, and 1 in 2020, uh, chose JJ Arcega Whiteside, uh, in a draft over DK Metcalf and over Terry McLaurin. They chose Jalen Rager over Justin Jefferson, which I know you pointed out in the last few weeks. So like they made huge mistakes on the wide receiver end. Um, I really like what you did with, uh, the Jalen Hurts, um, you know, suspicion and, and, and just doubt that he was going to go anywhere. Uh, obviously the, uh, they did redrafting. Uh, very, very well. And, and so it is possible. I don't know how many other examples there are of that. Obviously, we look at a team that's in the Super Bowl and say, well, they did it so anybody can do it. That's not actually true. But if it's been done before, um, no one can say that it can't be done. So they, they have that going for them. As far as salary cap stuff, people say, oh, Jalen Hurts, rookie deal. Uh, uh, the Eagles have, what is it, $65 million of dead cap? Space, like 30% of their 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 total salary cap is dead dead money. That's brutal. I mean, so even a team that's saddled with with a lot of that can do can do pretty good things as far as putting together a team. I mean, if you look at the Chiefs, um, Mahomes is more expensive than Rodgers, so it's not a salary cap issue, at least not not in those regards. They have other pieces though too. I don't know how many you know other high end. Contracts, you know, if they have a Kenny Clark or David Bakhtiari or Aaron Jones contract, I, I really don't know if we looked into it. But as far as, you know, you have to have a quarterback on a rookie deal, no, that's not actually true to get to the Super Bowl. Uh, the Eagles have a multi-prong, uh, rushing attack and a very good offensive line. I, I wonder how mobile Jordan Love is as far as, you know, a large game plan. I always kind of wish Rodgers ran more. Uh, he never got injured when he ran. He got injured when he got sacked those two seasons. So people always complain he's going to get injured. Well, that didn't actually happen that way. But I think if if uh, Green Bay creates a rushing attack, a multi-prone rushing attack, the Niners do the same kind of thing. I think it would give an interesting and much more Matt LaFleur-like type of an offense, I think. Uh, I like the drafting idea about tight end. See how that works out. I mean, obviously we look to a guy like Michael Mayer, you know, he got cut off and didn't call back, so we'll we'll just end it there. Um, yeah, look the 
There's a lot of things that work here. They have a lot of good football players on their team. I know they didn't win the Super Bowl, but and this is prior to Andy realizing that. It was his call from Saturday. But let's just talk about a team that, as you said, made a lot of mistakes, hasn't done everything quite perfectly. How exactly did they get to this point? Well, if you look at PFF, they have them, I think, as the number two offense and the number one defense. So that helps. Uh, how is that constructed? They have one, two, three, four, five, six players with an 80 grade or higher just on their offense. And one is very close, tight end Dallas Goddard. So that is three pass catchers, Dallas Goddard, Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown, three offensive linemen, Jordan Mailata, Lane Johnson, Jason Kelsey, and then quarterback Jalen Hurts. Three borderline elite offensive linemen, three pass catchers, and a quarterback. And that's just the dominant guys in the 80s. That doesn't include the guys in the 70s, like uh, the two guards, Landon Dickerson and Isaac Suomelo, which is, by my count, all five offensive linemen. All five. Oh, and running back Miles Sanders, because why not? So <laughs> it's, it's borderline a perfect offense in terms of actual starters. I mean, they, they have guys that didn't grade out quite as well. Quez Watkins, they're wide receiver, um, Jack Stoll, another tight end that apparently played a bunch. Grant Calcaterra is another tight end that played. Uh, tackle Jack Driscoll played quite a bit. Uh, didn't grade out very well. But again, as far as the, the, the basic number one starters go, all five offensive linemen were in the 70s. The quarterback, or 70s or higher, higher quarterback in the 80s, both wide receivers in the 80s, Tight end, high 70s, borderline 80s. The center was in the 80s, and both guards are in the 70s. Now, there's a second question. How did they acquire these? Well, some of them have been there for a long time. Jason Kelsey joined the Philadelphia Eagles in 2011. Lane Johnson has been with the Eagles since 2013. Jordan Mailata was in his third year and was a uh, seventh-round pick. Miles Sanders was in his fourth year with the Eagles. Landon Dickerson was in year two. Uh, Isaac Suomelo has been with the team since 2016. Dallas Goddard has been with the team since 2018. What does that look like to you? See, because a lot of people are going to want to look and say, A.J. Brown. A.J. Brown is the guy. You know what this is, though? This is draft and develop. Almost every single year they had one hit, and that all built up over the years, looking to, what is it now? the future. These are all investments that came due. And yeah, this is one of those kind of weird things where they all hit at the same time. Some of these guys are every other year, whatever. Everything kind of came together. And by the way, again, as I did point out, and as you pointed out that I pointed out, Jalen Hurts is the ultimate example of building for the future. Jalen Hurts did not help their team whatsoever when they took Jalen Hurts. And that really ticked a lot of people off. But he was the second highest graded offensive player behind only Jason Kelsey. And again, almost every single year, you get contributions. Devontae Smith in year two, right? Guys in year three, in year four, in year five, all the way back to 2011. It's consistently finding that one gem so that sometime later in the future, it all comes together. And then, yes, A.J. Brown is the one this year contribution that came via free agency. And it was a great acquisition. Defense had 12 guys. Um, some of them didn't play a ton, but overall 12 guys, 70 or higher. 12. Kind of something similar here too. The highest graded guy is Brandon Graham, who's been with Philadelphia since 2010. Josh Sweat had his first good year. Uh, well, not good year. He's gotten better pretty much every single year but it's all built up to his first grade in the 80s. He's been with the team since 2018. Um, TJ Edwards, added from the Badgers in 2019. You've got um, Javon Hargrave. He was originally a Pittsburgh Steeler, but has been with the team since 2020. You've got Reed Blankenship, who is a rookie this year. You could add Jordan Davis. He didn't play a ton, but he was another addition for this year that did help. Got Darius Slay, who was added from Detroit in 2020. Um, Jordan Davis, I already said. Uh, Milton Williams, who was a third-round pick, was a terrible rookie, 
But in year two, they uh, he didn't again didn't play a ton, but he got his grade up quite a bit. Year two, uh, Avanti Maddox had a seventy two grade. He's been with the team since twenty eighteen. James Bradbury um, and Hassan Reddick were two free agent acquisitions from this year. So again, it's mostly guys that have been with the team, draft and develop guys, a handful of, of free agents that were acquired years in the past. And then there were two acquisitions from this year to help the defense. Again, James Bradbury, who had a 71 grade, and Hassan Reddick, who came over from Carolina and had the best year of his career. It's another thing that happens when you join a really high-quality unit. Having the best year of your career is not all that unusual. The hard part about rep- replicating this, though, is that a lot of it is based on things that happened many, many years ago. And it also has to do with a lot of guys having good years at the exact same time. It's sort of just this perfect storm. You know, if you picture, let's say, you've got these five pistons that go up and down, and they go up and down in, in different intervals and slower and faster speeds. If you freeze it at any one point, You'll have sometimes a sum up and sometimes a sum down and these weird combinations, but every once in a while, all five will be up at the top. You can't really plan or predict that. I mean, I suppose you can if you have the right scheme, the right defensive coordinator, the right message, the right whatever, but it really is a combination of good players, good drafting, the right couple free agents to fill some holes, and then just everybody coming together and having a really good year all at the same time. You know, again, Brandon Graham has been a great player for pretty much his entire career, so that's pretty consistent, although this is the highest grade he's had since 2016. Hassan Reddick, best year of his entire career. Josh Sweat, best year of his uh, five-year career. TJ Edwards, best year of his career, uh, aside from his rookie year, but he didn't play a ton. Javon Hargrave, best year of his career since his last year in Pittsburgh in 2019. Best year as an Eagle. Even guys like Jason Kelsey. Kelsey's always been good. Yeah, fair enough. But this is still the best year of his career since 2017. Second best year he's ever had via PFF. Best year for Lane Johnson since 2019. All right, so yeah, I mean, listen, If let's say Rodgers comes back. If Rodgers has his you know, best year since 2020, and Bakhtiari has his best year since 2018, and Aaron Jones has his best year in four years, and, you know, everybody just has their best years, and Jair has his best year since he was the number one corner in football, and Stokes has the best year of his career. Yeah, dude, we're going to have a great freaking team, but I don't know how to just manifest that. It also points to, by the way, the Eagles kind of decline. Not not necessarily by a ton, because again, these guys are already studs, although a lot of the top guys are between, what, 30 and 35 years old. So what happens when Kelsey leaves and Lane Johnson leaves and Brandon Graham leaves and, you know, whatever, Darius Slay leaves. So how do we replicate this? Well, the first thing is draft and develop. And we've had some bad drafts, there's no doubt about it. I mean, some of these, again, go back to 2010. Ted Thompson had a rough two, three years down the stretch. Uh, Brian Gutekunst's first year was not great. The Jordan Love year was not great, right? He's, it's been a little rocky. This past year seems to be a really good draft. If you start stacking these, then what happens is down the line, they accumulate and you start to build really good teams again. This is why the Packers are so good for so long because Ted had so many good drafts and it compounded and all of a sudden you got stacks of just good players all over the place. And then even as the drafts start to deteriorate, the team stays up because the players aren't going anywhere. They're staying there for a while. Then you start to see the decline, and we don't have the ability to replace them. And so now we're, we're in a bit of a bind here because I, I feel like, although we certainly could see a lot of growth from a lot of areas, and so there doesn't necessarily need to be decline, but you're talking about losing Devontae and Rodgers potentially. Those are massive blows. We're talking about Aaron Jones winding down. We're talking about David Bakhtiari winding down. We're talking about the best, absolute best players on the team are the ones you're looking at going by by Adrian Amos. One of the best, if not the best, defensive pieces we've had on this team in the last couple of years. Aside from, you know, Zadarius, Rashawn, whatever. He's going out the door. So just to be able to maintain, for example, the Packers, if you look at our defense, we had, um, why are you still showing me? Oh, that's Kobe Jones. I thought it was Nicobe Dean. 
I was like, um, this is still the wrong team. Minus Kobe Jones, because he played uh, seven snaps. Five guys, five at 70 or higher. I guess you could say seven, because we'll throw Devontae Wyatt in there with his 69.9 grade. Five, that does, that's nowhere near the Eagles. But Devontae Wyatt, right? Jair and Rashawn were the top two. That's a great sign. We've also got guys like Stokes, right? There's a lot of Eagles guys that have been there for three, four years before, oh, here comes the good, right? We just need that. We need him to get on the page so that when that time comes, when the defense is rolling, he's going to be one of those guys ready to rock and roll. But again, that's that's the, the complicated part. But But even beyond that is the salary cap issue. So we've got a lot of guys leaving. We've got a tight salary cap. And so we really need some of these guys to step up. We really need Gutekunst to, to hit in the draft. That doesn't mean every pick, but instead of maybe finding that one gem, try to find two or possibly, if I'm being greedy, three really good players in the draft that can be in those 70s or 80s, whether it's rookie year, second year, third year, whatever, to kind of compensate a little bit. The biggest one, obviously, is going to be Jordan Love because none of this matters if you're talking two years down the road if we don't have a quarterback. I'm talking a, a baseline minimum of a, of a guy that can kind of hit in the 70s, you know? So while I completely agree that, yeah, the Packers could turn it around, I, I just think if you're looking at it from an absolutely realistic standpoint to lose Rodgers, to lose Devontae, and then potentially to be losing, you know, Amos and some other studs, whether it be this year or in the, the next year or two, um, it's going to be really hard to say that, yeah, we can easily turn this around and be in the Super Bowl in a couple of years when we couldn't even do it with Rodgers and Devontae and Aaron Jones and Adrian Amos and David Bakhtiari, although Bakhtiari has been hurt. But, you know, you get what I'm saying. It's going to take a lot to replace these guys. But obviously there's a lot of reason to love guys like Christian Watson. 77.1 grade as a rookie is really, really impressive. Hey, Jordan Love, 26 snaps, 78.7, fourth highest graded <laughs> offensive player, man. A.J. Dillon was the second highest offensive player, as much as everybody wants to talk trash about him, 88.1 rushing grade. I think we got a good player there. All right, Christian Watson was, again, with his 77. Elton Jenkins still seems to be a solid. He had a slow start, but down the stretch, even to as slow as he started, to end with a 72 grade is pretty solid. You know, Zach Tom had a borderline 70 grade. Romeo Dobbs didn't have the greatest grade, but we saw the flashes for sure. I have massive reservations about Runyon and Josh Myers. There's no question about that, but um, there's still certainly time for them to pick it up, especially Josh Myers is a second-round pick for a reason. There's a lot of raw tools there for him to be able to build on. And so there's some, and, and even John Runyon, you know, I mean, great pass protector already. Got to figure out the run blocking situation. Quay Walker, um, you know, didn't have the greatest rookie year, but we saw the flashes. I do have some thoughts about him potentially not being used properly but that's not super uh my lane just my own observations but we saw the flashes and i think uh you know maybe a, an off season or two to evaluate what he does and doesn't do best would would work out to our advantage so i i think there's plenty of pieces here but i think there's more questions than than there are reasons for optimism and so even if I could easily get to the point of saying we can be a good team and we're absolutely competitive in the division, that's not hard to do. But saying that we can be on the level of the Eagles, who've got like 10 guys in the 70s on offense and on defense, it's like, I, I couldn't give you a name of 10. You know, can, can, can you realistically say we're going to have a quarterback, five offensive linemen, two wide receivers, a tight end, and a running back 70 or higher? Running back, yes. Quarterback, yes. Tackles, well, we got Bakhtiari, we got Elton, that's two. Myers, no. Runyon, no. And then what? Who's the other guy? Ideally, it's Tom, who could be a yes, but I don't know if it will be Tom. Wide receivers? I think so. Christian is an automatic yes, and I think Dobbs could be a yes. And by the time this draft is concluded, it's not entirely impossible. So I guess with the most optimistic outlook, you could easily see two pass catchers uh, because either you're looking at Watson, Dobbs, Ture, potential guys in the draft. Is is it likely that there are two? I would say yes. Tight end, I would say it's possible, granted that we find somebody in the draft. Even then, it's unlikely as a rookie they do it, but but possible. At least three of five offensive linemen, I think, are are somewhat likely. If we're if we're looking at it from the optimistic standpoint, and then is it possible that one of the two, either Runyon 
uh, or Myers ends up at the 70 grade this year, I think yes. And I I, I understand PFF is not the be-all, end-all. I'm just talking in terms of generalities, in terms of how good they are, 70 being good, 80 being great, 90 being elite. So I, I think potentially we could get almost there, but not quite to the level of the Eagles. Defensively, pass rushers, I think two is, I mean, Rashawn is a lock. And then between Preston, Kingsley, and a potential draft pick, I think it's likely that we have uh, at at least one more. Preston had a 66 grade, so I I wouldn't say likely for him to hit 70, but likely that one of the two to three or whatever ends up with that. I think there's potential there. Defensive tackles, I mean, I don't know. Wyatt is a massive unknown. Kenny Clark, he had a 66 grade. I don't know what is going on with him. To be honest, I just, I don't have a clue. But it was his only down year of his career. He's never had a grade below a 70 aside from this year, which, you know, again, can't help but look at Joe Barry and just say, what the heck are we doing here? But I I think it's entirely possible there are two, again, from an optimistic standpoint, but it would be, I mean, it's, it's Kenny and Wyatt and maybe we draft somebody, but I doubt that that person ends up being a stud. But, but there's other guys, you know, TJ Slayton, Corners. I would say is, I mean, there's certainly a path to three, right? Razul, Jair, and Stokes. Linebacker, I mean, Devondre is a yes. Quay, sure. (laughs) We're talking optimism here. But safety is just a no, right? Safety is a flat out no chance. And I I struggled to, well, I shouldn't say I struggled to get to one. Rudy Ford was the third highest graded defensive player on our, you know, on our defense, 75 grade, basically. So again, with a very optimistic outlook, I can get us to be a really talented team. Um, I don't think, I, well, I know I can't make us a perfect team. And even with the optimistic outlook, if we're being realistic to even a, a minor degree, clearly some of these are not going to pan out, right? Clearly some of them, just as likely as it could be that some have good days, it's possible that some are good years, some guy could have bad, I mean, who knows, Rashawn Gary could have a 60 for some weird flukish reason. But again, even then you look at it and go, where does that put us in the grand scheme of things? I mean, let's be honest, that, that puts us in Super Bowl contention, it really does. Then it, then it really just comes down to the coaches putting them in an optimistic situation. Because if I'm talking, if we're talking all of our starters are good, then, I mean, you're, you're a Super Bowl caliber team. But, but we're, we're dealing with a real slim margins here and also dealing in fantasy a little bit. So the, the real situation is we just got to keep plugging away. Draft and develop is the real way, and we have to keep the salary cap healthy so that we're not in these situations where we're overpaying guys because of backloaded contracts and dead money, and so we don't have the money to really plug in the areas that we need and to even structure contracts the right way. We have to massively backload new contracts because we don't have any money this year or next year because of the inflated contracts that we have currently on the books, so we have to kind of push money back to avoid those big, giant speed bumps that we put in the road. We just need to really take care of these contracts a little bit better. It won't be that hard to do. We'll just kind of get a couple guys off the books or whatever the case is, and we can do that. And, you know, as JJ pointed out with the massive jump in, in salary cap, that's obviously going to mask some of these these issues that we've created. So it's it's doable, but my focus isn't necessarily on how do we get to the Super Bowl. It's we need to figure out our, our path with the quarterback. If Rodgers is leaving, we need to discover what Jordan Love is, and we just have to keep plugging away. But this is why, I mean, I'm telling you, the draft, it's not only the most exciting part of the year for me, but it really is the most crucial. Because what happens in the draft, it doesn't just impact this year. It's not just about, oh, we draft Bijan. How good is he going to be for my fantasy team for the Packers this year? This We're talking about setting up the future. How good are the Packers going to be for the next three, five, ten years? That really needs to be the outlook, and that that is the reality. And if, and if he can hit, if you can get one, two, three, four really good drafts, you can set this franchise up for the next 15 years. I mean, again, Seattle had like two good drafts and a couple of good free agent acquisitions and they were just dominant i mean it was a, it was a smaller window what five six years or whatever the whole legion of boom thing but that's all it takes a couple good drafts a couple good decisions over two years and you are just destroying the nfl so let's let's really freaking nail it in the draft this year like i believe we did last year freaking just nail it and let's be responsible with the cap let's chart a course for the future And let's stick it to everybody that says that we're headed for the dark era.
just absolutely knock this draft out of the park and we are going to be fine pending the quarterback situation. We might need one more one more thing from you, good. Nail this draft and if Jordan Love doesn't pan out then just, you know, one more, one more good uh good acquisition of a quarterback and then we're set up. All right, long answer. Sorry, Garrett, go ahead. Hey, Ryan. Hey. Uh fresh off uh doing my morning talk show host Hey, nice uh, gig, and uh, it went quite well. Nice. <clears throat> I have to say that uh, I could get used to this, and it was pretty cool doing uh, radio talk show host. Um, and I know it may not sound like it because I'm just kind of the after run that we have. It's a tradition <clears throat> that I'm going to explain just real quickly. Uh, when a co-host comes in, they have this thing called the ditch to ditch relay. And outside of the radio station, there's a highway, and you run through two roads and two ditches to get to the highway, and you have to touch it and run back. And they time you to see how fast you ran, and they hit you against someone else that's also there in the in the broadcast booth. And it just so happened that the other radio host is a Bears fan, so we went at it all morning and finally threw down the gauntlet and said, okay, let's do ditch to ditch, and let's just uh, end this right now. <laughs> and uh, I ended up winning um the race by 12 seconds there you go that's right 12 seconds the guys in the in the radio booth were hysterical so uh ended on a good note so happy to say packers uh did get a final win against the bears um even if it is uh after the season's over so the winning continues so have a great weekend have a great super bowl weekend uh go chiefs and uh we'll see what happens have a good one Cool, man. I'm glad that that went well. And uh, obviously, if you enjoy it, it's no reason you can't continue doing it. And, you know, I, I keep pushing it on everybody, but podcasting is basically free. Um, so if you like sticking a microphone in your face and just talking about stuff, just see how it goes, I guess. You know, I don't know. Dakota, what's going on? Hey, y'all. This is Dakota, that nerd in Tennessee. How you doing, Ryan? Doing great, man. Uh, I haven't called in in a minute. I've been... Uh... Very busy, <laughs> quite. But this is the morning, uh, the day of the Super Bowl, approximately 10.30, uh, of course. As always, I am working, but I should be off in time. Um, and I'm kind of excited about today because this is the first time my fiancé and I are actually hosting an event for her family. Um, you know, you got that whole thing where this is the first time in NFL history that you got two black quarterbacks leading the two teams and in uh the Super Bowl. So I figured, you know, we're we're a mixed couple, a mixed relationship. I'm white, she's black, so why not? Let's let's throw the uh throw the party at our house. <sighs> Which to be honest I'm kinda regretting because <laughs> that's stuff I gotta do, but right. anyway it's gonna be a good time. I I like, you know, I'm just going to say I'm kind of go- – I, I want to go for the Eagles because I like Jalen Hurts. I, I enjoy watching him play. He's kind of interesting. Of course, Patrick Mahomes is Patrick Mahomes. But um, I don't know, man. And, I, and I've heard you, Ryan, and other folks go back and forth, man. Philly burns down their city when they win. Yep. I don't want to support that. Right. So, I don't know. This is a hard decision. I like Jalen Hurts. Oh, but, you know – Chiefs. Andy Reid, come on. You can't not cheer for Andy Reid, right. I guess. That's solid. Anyway, I'm over here struggling. I don't even remember why I called. I just wanted to say, hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, yeah, that, that's it. Y'all have a good time, man. Peace. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I hope you have a good uh, party. I think the question is, what did you guys do for the party, like food-wise? I'm sure, well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. I'm guessing you had them bring some food over. But um, I'm hoping you did it up pretty big. You don't want to have the wife's family come over and then be like, hey, guys, look, I don't really know how to cook or anything, but I got some chips and a jar of salsa, so knock yourself out. I could also, you know, put some shredded cheese on your chips and throw them in the microwave. (laughs) Your wife's family would just look at you. Freaking white people, man, I swear. It's good, though, man. Just melt some cheese on chips. I like it. Leave me alone, man. Do whatever I want. <sighs> Game just ended. 
I got to finally got to the other side of the Super Bowl here. Okay. One of the more exciting Super Bowls I've seen in a long time. I'm glad you said that because I've heard nothing but complaints about the Super Bowl. By the way, I should save this for tomorrow. The the penalty thing, it's it's I could not be any more tired of hearing about it. I didn't see it live, so maybe if I saw it, there would have been a lot more outrage, but I woke up and people are complaining about it. And it's, what, two days later, I'm still seeing videos on YouTube popping up about it. Dude, I don't care. I don't care at all. It's stupid. You lost. Shut up. Absolutely ruined by the one of the worst calls <laughs> I've seen go. at the end of a Super Bowl. Look, again, I didn't watch it live. And and I don't like that those things are called penalties, right? I don't like that. But those things are called penalties by the letter of the law and everything else. So do I wish they would generally let those things go? Yes. But I also don't think that we should just start making new rules because, hey, it's getting close. Let's just not call penalties anymore. So it is what it is, man. I mean, the Packers, when we played Tampa, there was horrible penalties and everything. That's just that's the way it goes. But at least that was... You know, what What was it? You had Rashawn Gary in a chokehold and a referee standing right there and he didn't throw the flag? You know? I mean, it's like, at least that is, you should have done something and you didn't. Clearly. This is, I mean, it's a penalty. It is. I don't know what to tell you. It shouldn't be. It's stupid. It's ticky-tack. But, I mean, this is, this is the NFL, man. This is just the way it is. This is the way the NFL goes. And, um... I don't know. I'm just, I, I guess I'm just getting kind of tired of, I mean, I, again, it's one thing if it's just not a penalty at all and a penalty gets called and it completely changes the game from a win to a loss, but that's not what happened. It was a ticky tack penalty that did get called, didn't need to, but it's also not the wrong call. And, um, it didn't change the outcome of the game necessarily. My understanding is it just prevented the Eagles from coming back, which certainly is not a guarantee that they were going to win anyways. So, I don't know. I, I'm i just tired of hearing about it, to be completely honest. I, I don't care. I Listen, if I was an Eagles fan, sure, I'd be ticked off. But and here's the other thing that I was thinking about. These things are, are never going to stop happening. And one of the biggest reasons why is because... I think there's going to be a heightened level of penalties on that part of the game because there's more anxiety about, like, I can't let this guy beat me. So there's going to be more grabbing and more of these, which means there's going to be more flags, which means there's going to be more controversy, which means there's going to be more complaining. And it also means there's going to be a lot more conspiracy theories about, look at all these flags at the end of games to decide games. Right, because there's more actual penalties because the players are freaking out because the game's on the line. So this is never really going to stop. Now, would I like for them to, again, if, if these guys were just doing training 24-7, like year-round, this is what you do, you're, you're a referee, and then one of the things they worked on is let's not call stupid ticky-tack nonsense. Like, just because you see his hand wrapped around his body doesn't mean you have to throw a flag. Look at the wide receiver. Unless you see his path being impeded, unless you see his body being turned or pulled, don't throw the flag. Now, I understand it kind of gets into a gray area because you can technically slow the guy down without pulling on him, but it would be my preference to just leave it alone unless you can physically see, and I've said this about holding too, unless you can physically see that it impedes their ability because we've seen this in the past where, you know, a guy, and I've even said this to Packer fans who are complaining about non-call, and it's like, look, if, if our guy is able to bend around the corner and get to the quarterback and I don't see him being impeded, but there happens to be a guy's arm kind of in front of him, I kind of don't care. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's just going to happen. But if he's being held or pulled or whatever, throw the flag. If not, leave it alone. That would be my preference, but that's not the way it goes, and it's kind of at the referee's discretion. And so he clearly wrapped his arm around his hip and grabbed him from behind. The referee's discretion is to either leave it alone or, hey, I saw it, I'm throwing the flag. He decided to throw the flag. If he didn't want the flag thrown, he shouldn't have put his hand around his freaking hip. Okay? And if you didn't want the game to come down to this penalty, you should have done something in the previous, you know, hour of the football game to not put yourself in this situation. So, I mean, it's one thing if we want to discuss it the night after, and I know you're calling immediately after the game, but, you know, I go on YouTube every single day to see, like, what are we talking about? 
give me some new news that I can use for the podcast, and it's the same crap. Every other video is about the uh, the penalty, and I watched a PFF video about the draft, and they started it by discussing the penalty, and it's like, dude, if I have to hear about this penalty one more time, I swear, I'm just unplugging this thing, man. I don't care. He grabbed him. They threw a flag. It is what it is. As far as egregious penalties go, this is way down on the list. I mean, you got that, what was that, Saints game? where the guy got blown up like five seconds before the ball got there, and then they got eliminated from the playoffs after that or something. Like, that is one where it's like, okay, we're going to talk about this for like a week straight, and it's going to be nonstop. And if you're a, a fan of that team, you're going to burn down somebody's city, because that's BS. But this? Come on, man. We can't start crucifying referees when they get it right. <laughs> and again, you probably should leave it alone, but it's still a penalty. So I just, I don't know. I don't care. And I'm, I, you know, and, and here's the other thing. We've been talking back and forth. I think it was Dakota was just talking about not sure what team to root for. Here's, here's a benefit. We don't like Eagles fans, right? That's sort of a consensus. They seem to be somewhat of a bunch of jerks. Well, we didn't get to see the Chiefs lose, but we get to see Eagles fans not only watch their team lose, but in a controversial call. So be happy about it. Because now they go from being angry to being furious the entire offseason. So instead of us complaining, we should laugh. In fact, we should go on social media and say, looks like a good call to me, huh, fellas? Even if you think it's a terrible call, just say it's a great call just to piss them off. Because it's funny. On the eve when Roger Goodell came out and and said that uh, the refs did a great job this year. I don't know who he's fooling. The refs have been a horrible this year. Yeah, agree like with that. Like they get worse every year, and the NFL just sits there and says, "Well, nope, everything's good." It literally makes me want to not watch football. Well, and that, and they just keep adding new rules. Like that's going to help something. The only thing that seems to be helping is just adding instant replay to everything, so that they can go back and change all the mistakes they make. But the officiating, you're right; it's not getting better; it's getting worse. And all the pe- new penalties and emphasis. And, oh, I hate so much when they start talking about emphasis because you know they're just going to ruin the first five weeks of football, just to just to prove a point, you know. And then then it kind of tapers, but it's still they keep calling that crap. I hate when they put emphasis on stuff, and for what? Well, we just want to drive home a point, dude. You're ruining the freaking game. Don't call. Pe- See. I don't like how legalistic some of the stuff gets. And this goes to that call as well. It's why I don't generally like that those things are called because it's legalistic. Well, technically, his hand... I just want you to make sure that something didn't happen that completely ruined like the, how the game was supposed to be. So again, if you don't see the guy being held, pulled, something, let it go, right? Unless you physically see something happening, don't don't just assume. Don't just, hey, I saw his arm around him. Okay, but did you see his path being impeded or anything like that? Then leave it alone, right? It, it doesn't have to be letter of the law. I'm just asking you to watch and make sure that something didn't happen that wasn't supposed to happen, right? If you saw what looked like somebody's hand near their face, you don't call face mask. You call face mask when you see the guy's head getting jerked around and his hand in between the bars of his face mask. Right, unless you physically see that action being taken that is against the rules, leave it alone. And I, I do think it gets to be too legalistic where, well, his hand was here and it shouldn't have been there and you know we're going to put an emphasis on this. No, no emphasis. No emphasis. If somebody does something, and by the way, it should be egregious, not minor. If somebody does something egregious, you call it. If it's minor, you let it go. And yes, the fans are going to piss and moan about it, but you know what? It's better to let people play more often than not, um, even even when it doesn't benefit us sometimes, when I think the other team's being more physical. And I feel like that happened down the stretch where teams were getting away with a ton of stuff. But, I mean, if that was the the way that it was across the board, good. Then you can teach teams to be a little bit more physical, a little bit more grabby. And as long as it's balanced across the board, I'm fine with it. But don't throw ticky-tack flags and... Um, I mean, in terms of how I would like to see things changed in the future, try to do away with ticky-tack flags and try to be more consistent. And yes, the more replay, the better, because I'm willing to slow down the game so that you guys don't continue to ruin it. So challenge anything you want. I don't care, especially with the eye in the sky. Things go much quicker these days. I'm all for it. When I see like a product completely ruined by something that they fully back, say what you want, 
that was not a foul. And it was the ticky tackiest thing yes. at the end of the game. Right, it Literally, was. that was a foul to give the Chiefs the win. So that's just disappointing. And the more they do this kind of stuff, the more they're going to make the lover of the game fan, which I consider myself, just like, you know what? I don't even want to watch this crap anymore. I'll just watch college and high school football. The NFL can just become a fantasy league, and that's it. So it's it's just, gosh, it's just a bummer. So, oh, well. I go, I go, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think we're we're mostly on the same page. I think ultimately that was a foul. It shouldn't be a foul, and it's very much on the ticky tack side. But I mean, that that's just that's every play. You know what I mean? Like every foul is. I shouldn't say every foul. Fifty percent of the fouls are ticky tack fouls, and you know, the, the, every single play there's there's something that's at least ticky tack that doesn't get called. So I mean, this is just this is just the way it goes, you know. So I don't know. Anyways, why don't we take a break? Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy if you want to support the podcast. There's also Packing a Podcast on Venmo. Please check out Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. See if that is something you'd be interested in supporting. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and, not uh, as simple you know, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. It's only a kick. A jump. A block. It's only a serve. It's only a tackle. A run. It's only for the fans. After all, it's only pressure. You got this. Adidas. Hey, Ryan. This is Trucker Bob. Trucker Bob. And uh really screwed up on my last phone call. That's all right. What I did, I said I had the perfect song for... Uh, the oh, idea yeah. I had for your show. Yeah, let's do that. And when I played it on my phone, um, it didn't play or record on yours. So I got my wife's phone here. Here we go. And I've got the perfect song for your new show. Let's do this. In which you will invite podcasters from other cities we're playing in, uh, the Packers are playing in, and then you can... Um, Anyway, here's the song. <laughs> Classic. Anyways, that's the song I had for your show. When you have once a week, you take on and when the Packers take on a team you talk to another podcaster and the two of you can go at it and that could be the theme song for your show anyways that was my idea well the thing I really like about that is that it's it would be my theme song just for the show in general 
and obviously there's 31 other teams. And so it's just a kind of a casual thing. It's kind of like a ha-ha, you know, if we play the Titans, like, huh, that's funny. Bears, I never heard that before. Oh, you never heard that? Oh, no, no. But then twice a year we play the Bears, and it's like, oh, sorry, dude, that's just like the theme. So, like, I didn't do that just because of you. It's like Aaron Rodgers drinking the purple drink after the Vikings game. Like, oh, it's not because of you. Like, this is just, I just like the purple. It's no big deal. It's got nothing to do with you. But it does. <laughs> so that those those two times a year you got to, Kind of be like, oh, my bad, man. That's just kind of the song we use. But uh, anyways, uh, glad to have you. It would be funny. It would be quite funny. You can't tell them that the song's coming either. You got to be like, all right, man, we're going to go in three, two, one, boom. And then you just hit them with the bears still suck. And then immediately hit them with questions. So, bears, how do you think they did last year? Pretty good or suck or anything kind of come to mind? It's not a terrible idea. Hey, what's going on? This old modern firefighter. Hold up. Hey, I uh, just wanted to. I know, I know everybody else called my Super Bowl as well, um, but that was actually a pretty great Super Bowl. It was very go. entertaining. Except, um, I didn't like the call. It was holding, but go. the Chiefs didn't really need that call to beat them, and it would made a more entertaining game if, like, the Eagles could get a field goal range within like a minute or whatever. I, I, and it would have made the game better. So. It's a ticky-tack call that I wish they wouldn't have called that would have made the game better had they not called it. I think that's fair to say. Um, but again, I don't want to, because I, I, the reason I bring it up is because I heard somebody else kind of debating it, and they're like, well, you shouldn't call penalties like that down the stretch because it makes the game worse. Well, I don't want to go so far down the line that we're talking about not calling penalties and just letting people get away with stuff. You know what I mean? Like, we got to draw a line somewhere. You you can't get away with crap just because it's getting further down into the game because that can work against you too, right? If somebody's leading a comeback and then there's holding, which prevents a comeback, and then the game's over. Like if it was on a fourth down, it's like, sorry, we don't call penalties in the last minute of the game. You know what I mean? So you just got to call it like you call it. And if you call ticky-tack BS, then I guess you call ticky-tack BS. But that's what it was. It was ticky-tack, it was BS, but it's a penalty. He called it, and that's what it is. You know, but it is what it is. Um, Patrick Mahomes already didn't surpass Aaron Rodgers. It's like he's great. So yeah, it's you know I'm sad about that, but I do respect Mahomes' talent and heart and grit and everything else. Um, I do, I'm also hoping uh, that we trade Rodgers and that Love lives up to his QB class. Because to be honest with you, Hurst played. Very well. It's just a passer. Yep. So uh, I hope the Packers will see that and how they build around Hurts and got him a good number one. Like he had two number ones, and they did a great job building around him. So I'm hoping that we do the same. Well, yeah, and and I've pointed this out before, but if you look at the draft class and look at those picks, you got Joe Burrow, who had a 91 passing grade, Jalen Hurts, 84 passing grade, Tua, 82 passing grade, Justin Herbert, 76.7. Jordan Love, 77.1. Yes, it's a limited sample size, but you got the top five quarterbacks. If Jordan Love's not good, he's the only one in the top five that doesn't perform well in that draft class. And and look, there are years where, you know, it's, it's, it's a good class for a certain uh, position. Like this year, it's, it's probably tight end slash running back, and it's not super great at quarterback this that or the other it's entirely possible and it seems to be even if Jordan Love's not good it's a good quarterback year Joe Burrow Jalen Hurts Tua and Herbert um seem to be four good quarterbacks to come out of that one class but again you got Jordan Love who was the other first round pick who's right in that mix who was a high-talent developmental guy who's had time to develop behind Aaron Rodgers. So, yeah, maybe he's the one guy that sucks in that group. I mean, again, he's right in line with the rest of them based on his limited play. He's, he's fourth out of five ahead of Justin Herbert. But, you know, maybe it's just a fluke and he's going to suck and all that. It's possible. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Well, Love and every QB that was drafted in this class was pretty good. Yep. You know, the bad ones was uh, Tua and Hurts. And even they graded out, well, yeah, I mean, the the, the quote-unquote bad ones, but they graded out great. And then you've also got Tyler Huntley, which, you know, I mean, he's not fantastic, doesn't grade out all that well, but he's an undrafted free agent who has come in and performed 
for the Baltimore Ravens. So even the undrafted free agent Tyler Huntley is panning out. The only guy that played really poorly was Jacob Eason, uh, who's been one of the worst quarterbacks in football (laughs) basically since forever. He's had uh, two years, 10 attempts only, but in two years, uh, 2021, he had a 29.6 grade. This year, 29.2. So, I mean, obviously needs more opportunities, but um, yeah. Oh, and Bryce Perkins is the other guy. He had a 60, which is average. So, um, you know, Bryce Perkins as another undrafted free agent, getting time to play and was actually average. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty better than average quarterback class, if I do say so myself. I mean, you even compare it to uh, um, 2021. You know how many good quarterbacks were in 2021? One, Trevor Lawrence. That's it. Mac Jones, 68. Davis Mills, 63. Sam Ellinger, 56. Justin Fields had a 54. Trey Lance had a 52. Kyle Trask had a 44. And Zach Wilson had a 43. That is a garbage, garbage quarterback class compared to 2020. You go back to 2019. Daniel Jones is the best quarterback with a 70. Kyler Murray, 63. Jared Stidham, 62. Gardner Minshew, 56. David Blau, 51. Brett Rippian, 46. Trace McSorley, 37. I mean, I, I don't know that you're going to find too many draft classes that are this good. 2018 had two. Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. And you say, yeah, but those are two really good ones. Not really. Josh Allen didn't grade out as well as... Uh, What's his name from the Bengals there? That guy. And Lamar would be, what, fourth on the list? Fifth on the list, maybe? So, yeah, 2020, even without Jordan Love, is shaping up to be like the best crop of quarterbacks in the entire NFL. 2017, you got Mahomes at a 90. And then you got Mitchell Trubisky, who had a 74. Uh, And then you have Nick Mullins at a 69.9. And it's all down from there. And there's a bunch of them, including Deshaun Watson, who had a 51 grade. Uh, Nathan Peterman, 68, you know, just uh, 2016 is not terrible. The highest is a 75, which is Jacoby Brissett, but at least you got three in the 70s with Jared Goff and Brandon Ellen with his three passes. 2020 is, is, it's the best crop of quarterbacks of any year to play in this, in this, uh, group. 2015, Jameis Winston was the highest graded with a 66. So, um, yeah, that is a phenomenal quarterback class. And they play pretty good. Just two of just gets hurt a lot. So I'm hoping that that gives us a good, you know, indication of what our future would be. Also, I'm sure you probably talked about this as well. Um, I was reading and it said the Jets had inquired about Rodgers and they had like a great trade. Like they did like a baseline for a trade, which would be like a um, – second round and the fourth round this year and then a conditional second round in 2025 if he plays in 24 it will turn into a first round which I actually think it would be an awesome trade you know um, I, I prefer to get something in 24 but getting that you know two potential you yeah. know a first round potential if he plays I think it's fair for both teams and um, we can do some dirt you know we got a good receiver in the fourth round so having a second and fourth round would be awesome, you know. Um, so, and then having another second. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but hopefully we get this done. So, all right, go Pat, go. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's very few people that have taken the time to look at this. And the more I look at it, it's just there's constant videos and, and from people on Twitter and Facebook and everybody, just fans that have had time to really digest this. I don't see too many people left that, believe that the best thing to do is to bring Rodgers back. And if they are, they're they're really not saying much anymore. I mean, it's just, it uh, again, I, I've talked about it so much, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's it's basically crystal clear. Um, love Rodgers and what he's done. Um, yes, he's probably a better quarterback option for this year. That's irrelevant to me in, in the grand scheme of things when you look at the total picture. Um, I, I And I don't know that that to even be true. Again, even if you just look at what Rodgers did this year, compare it to the grade that Jordan Love got, Jordan Love graded out higher, and Jordan Love didn't even grade all that great. It was, just, what, a 77? If Rodgers is going to get us like 75, 74 grades, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's not great. 
that's mediocre, you know? Um, so yeah, we, we need to get that done. I'm excited about love. And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly at this point, not only, it's not even so much excited. I'll get excited when the time comes and we get to actually watch them. At this point, I'm, I'm just ready to move in that direction and to start talking about it and to start having those conversations. I mean, now we talk about love and it almost feels like you're being spiteful. Like you're just saying it to spite Rogers or whatever, but if Rodgers is traded, he is our quarterback, and we've got to really dig into this guy. We got to, and and I'm, you know, I and a lot of other podcasters and writers, we're going to hit this Jordan Love thing really, really hard. Because as much as this quarterback controversy conversation's been going on, we haven't really dug into Love because it doesn't really feel real yet. But you know, at, at, at that moment when the when the trade becomes real and and or. We just find out that it's happening. Obviously, that'll be the big news, but we really got to figure out what to do with with love and to talk about love. But it's going to be more about learning about love. But also the, the biggest emotion that I have right now is just fear that we're going to miss out. It's, you know, fear that we're going to stick with Rodgers, which is entirely an option, by the way. And um, love's going to ask for a trade. He's going to go somewhere else. I'm I'm legitimately concerned about that. And um, I just want to make sure that we don't let that happen. As much as I'll be excited about finding the next quarterback and all that, which is really probably going to be more of a disaster than anything else, with all the signs pointing to Love being at least a quality quarterback on the order of a, of a you know, I don't know what you'd want to call him. If, if it's a Jalen Hurts or a, well, I mean, if we wanted to be crazy, we could call him a Pat Mahomes. At least that's what Ken Seifert called him, uh, ESPN. The article appears to be missing, but Ken Seifert did call him that. I'll tell you what, we'll say we'll save that for tomorrow. But the the point is about the rushing thing. <sighs> See, there's there's so much I want to touch on, but I want to talk about it tomorrow. It is interesting. It it is interesting to figure out what box we want to put him in. Because I, I make the Jalen Hurts comparison, not because I think that they're necessarily similar. In fact, I don't think that they really are. I'm I'm more or less talking about a guy that didn't have a lot of hype was seen as being very flawed, taken a little bit later, and then comes in and is able to operate efficiently in a high-quality system. A guy that is not considered an elite quarterback, although he did grade out extremely well. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he was not under pressure very much and had very good wide receivers and et cetera, et cetera, which isn't taken into account with your grade, right? I mean, it, it's I've mentioned before when Rodgers, Rodgers is going to have a higher grade when he's protected more. Why? Because, well, let's say you have a... 50 grade when you're under pressure and a 90 grade when you're not under pressure. The percentage that you're under pressure and not under pressure is going to tell you how good your grade is, right? If you're under pressure 5% of the time compared to 95% of the time is going to make a difference between having a 90 grade and a 50 grade. But anyways, that's more of what I'm talking about. But, you know, I don't know that I, I really do think he's more of a Pat Mahomes type. And I don't mean in terms of, of uh, talent level, but when I think about the way that they play. I think he's a really high-quality pocket passer. I think he has some good uh, movement ability to break the pocket, keep his eyes downfield, and throw, and occasionally can run. But is not necessarily a high-level athlete. It's not does not have top-end speed like a Justin Fields, for example. So if I had to put him in a camp, it would be sort of that kind of camp, you know? Um, what would be a different comp? Just because people are going to be offended by the... the uh, Pat Mahomes thing. I would say Herbert, but I think even Herbert's probably faster. That dude's got some wheels. But you get what I'm saying, right? They're, they're, he's clearly a passer first, but he has enough athleticism to hurt you if you kind of take your eyes off it or whatever. But you're probably not drawing up designed runs for him, right? And he's probably not going to break 60-yard touchdown runs either like Justin Fields does. It, it's just he's not that kind of a guy. So I, I forgot the question at this point, but I'm just, I'm just rambling. Anyways, Omar's got one more call. We'll do uh, Omar's last call, and then we'll Pack it in for the night. Hey, this is uh, Omar Fafai to call back again uh, real quick. I kind of think that we should force his hand. When I sit there and thought about it, I was like, while he's doing his little four days of darkness retreat and everything else, we should just be like, hey, we traded you to the Jets. <laughs> or we traded you this place. And like, we'll ju- we should literally just call the 12 teams, like you said, just to just inquire, like, hey, would you want Rodgers? If you did, how much would you give up? Take the best offer. As I know it's, you should be like a realtor and like wait 
because you might get the offer that you want. But just to get us off the book, excuse my cousin. But well, I think it's just better for us just getting them off our team and saving that money. Like, I know we'll save more money if we do it June 1st, but, like, if we make the decision for him, yeah, um, it'll be better. And then it'll be like, if you don't want to go there, he'll retire. When? Okay, we we don't have to pay you all this money. Yeah. I assume you retired. We ain't got to pay him all this extra money, you know? So then we got cap space. So we went with cap space. If he takes the trade, cool, we went with draft, you know, things, and we just – Suck this year in cap space, but then it'd be over. Yeah. So that's what they should do is force his hand. And he can, he can blame him on people he wants to, but at the end of the day, it is what it is. Because I feel like if we wait and try to get the best offer, Derek Carr is a free agent, you know, um, he's going to sign, he, he can go somewhere. The Jets might be like, hey, we can get Derek Carr and we can keep all our picks. You know what I'm saying? Because they, they're going to go with their uh, Wilson anyway. Eventually, yeah. they just want him to get some more training and everything else. So, shoot, that that could be a, a win-win for them. So, I just think we should just force his hand and just get this. Just, just forget trying to get all the super amount of picks we can get because at the end of the day, just I mean, love the Packers, but we're not going to win a Super Bowl with him playing the way he played last last year and. I don't see him changing the way he played. Like, even he was playing bad before the finger. Yeah. So it's like, and I mean, I know Jordan probably can't force a trade, but we're basically just wasting his years. It's like the worst thing for us to do is if we trade Jordan Love, and like I said previous when I call, he'd be a great quarterback like all other quarterbacks in his draft plan. And then we'll look stupid in the face. Yeah, so it's right. like, might as well just force his hand, man up, and right. be like, yo, we traded you. Even if we trade him to the Texans. Even though I know you wouldn't accept it, it retired. Right. But we need to be smart and just forge his hand because all this work with him ain't work. All right, go back, go. I do think that that would work. Um, and, and there's a part of me that doesn't agree, but there's a part of me that does. And, I, you know, I if you go back several years ago, I do think the Packers are a little bit more, we do what we do, it's a business, I don't care what you think. And that's probably the right way to go. And you know what? Everybody trashed the Packers for it. Aaron Rodgers came out with this big sob story about how the Packers are mean and they don't treat people nice. And they make people go, you know, you drafted Jordan Love when you had me here. That was mean. You let, you know, Kumaro go right after I said I liked him. And you did that just to spite me. And that was mean, even though that's completely fake. Obviously, the Packers wouldn't do that. You know, the way you treat people is mean and you don't do things that are nice. And so what did the Packers do? They're like, all right, you know what? Let's tone it down. We're going to have sit-downs with Rodgers. We're going to be nicer. We're going to have more conversations. And everybody's like, yay, this is wonderful. And now it's kind of turned around to where people are like, I want you to man up and do the right thing. And what are they doing? Like, oh, no, 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 we love Rodgers. We're going to work with him. Whatever he says we're going to do. So it's kind of coming back to bite everybody now about all this nicey, nice nonsense. And I think you're right. There is an element of, you know, granted, they did give them their word that they would do it. It would be pretty underhanded and kind of trash to do it. But if you rewind further, they shouldn't have put themselves in this spot. They shouldn't have, they shouldn't have backed down. I, and, and even I, at the time, probably thought it was a good thing to, to get on the same page with the quarterback. But what did it get us? We don't have a happy quarterback. We don't have a happy locker room. We don't have any of that. I think what we have is a team that bends over backwards for the quarterback at the expense of everybody else. And I have a feeling that's part of the problem with some of the locker room. Not really feeling, you know, super valued. Just a guess. I don't know. And they shouldn't have given Rodgers the contract that handcuffed the team and then bend over backwards and give him everything he wants, like Randall Cobb and blah, 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 um, and talk to him about all the draft picks and everything else, which everybody says, how dare you not consult him because he knows everything. He is the all-knowing. You know, he could easily do the GM's job, even though obviously he can't. It's a completely different skill set. You want his input? Sure. Just like I want a lot of people on the team's input, but I mostly want my own input and a little bit of the coach's input and a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of interest from what the quarterback thinks, um, if anything at all. And you're right, they should be in a position of power right now to say this is what we're doing, if they so chose. And I, I think you're right, it would work. Um, if he wants to be so spiteful as to say, I'm going to stay, but I refuse to play for any of these teams because what you did was underhanded, I, I guess you could do that. And there's not a lot we could do about it because we can't cut them. 
Um, so he would just sit here. But again, what would you do then? Okay, cool. I guess you're sitting behind Jordan Love because he's our starting quarterback this year, and there's no way he's doing that, right? Um, so, I, I mean, you, you can't do that at this point. It's, it's you know, you, you, it's going to be real ugly for, for yourself, for the organization, for all your players. They're going to be really pissed off. Everybody's going to be ticked that you did that after you gave them your word. Um, but but I do think it's, you know, the, the, the Packers have the right to trade them. There is not a no-trade clause in his contract. They can trade them to whoever they want. And while it's true that he can torpedo it, then do it. I mean, you do what you got to do. We do. We're doing what we got to do. And, and what we need to do is trade you. And you're right. The fact that we, we are sitting on our hands and like, well, whatever you want to do, BS, bro. If you can't see Brian Gutekunst, if you can't see that keeping Aaron Rodgers is a terrible decision, or if you can't simply man up and do it and say, this is what needs to happen. I'm sorry. I love you. But this is what we are doing. That's a problem. I mean, I know that the team is somewhat handcuffed to him. And I accept that every team is somewhat handcuffed to their superstars, which I think is BS, but it's a thing. Especially the quarterbacks. But if you're so handcuffed that you're going to go down this road, which is a horrific road to go down, which is my view at this point, if you can't see that, that is a major issue. right? I will back you up on your decision to, to give him the contract and all that stuff. I, I wasn't a big fan of it, but hey, at least I can see it. Now... As bad as this team was, you're going to bend over backwards to be able to keep him? No chance. So you're right. They, you know, it would be it would be a strategy that would probably work. I think what would be even funnier is if you trade him to the Raiders. Because now if you want to be petty, you can be petty and shoot down Devontae. Like, oh, really? You don't want to play with Devontae? That's crazy, dude. Well, we'll see if we can work something else out. Sorry, Devontae. I thought we had a deal there. I thought you guys were cool. I don't know. I mean, we did everything we could. We gave you guys a... Real nice package and all that, uh, reasonable, and I uh, was really excited about you guys getting reunited, but I guess he doesn't want to play with you. I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> Just be super petty about it. But yeah, at, at this point, you can't do it because you've already given them your word. My issue is that you put yourself in this position. Not only are you completely handcuffed to Rodgers to the point where this contract and everything else, but you're to the point now where you're groveling, and it's like, well, whatever you want to do, Rodgers, that's stupid. You do what you need to do, Brian Gutekunst. And what you need to do is to move on. You just need to. I mean, listen, even if, because there's a lot of speculation about, well, maybe they know Jordan Love is a star, or maybe they know he's trash or whatever. Let's just pretend they know that he's garbage, right? Which I think you can do. I don't think you can know that he's a star, but you can know that he's certainly not. If he's not getting it, if he, like, if he can't even do it in practice, then you know you got a problem. Even if that's the case, I'm moving on. I'm moving on. And then I'm probably drafting a quarterback. Maybe not. If I don't really like this crop, then I'm probably not doing it. But let's say we really like Anthony Richardson or whatever. Do it. Draft him. Then you give Jordan Love his year. He doesn't play well. Anthony Richardson is next year. We trade Jordan Love for like a sixth round pick or whatever it is we can squeeze out of that. And um, we try Anthony Richardson. And if that, you know, that's going to take a while because he's a project. He's going to sit for a year then year two, and then you're kind of doing the Jordan Love, hey, maybe in year three kind of thing. And if that doesn't work, you move on. You know, It's a disaster. But what I'm saying is, either way, I'm not keeping Rodgers. It's not even a Jordan Love thing. It's a, I'm looking at Rodgers and the contract and the team, and it doesn't make sense. Even if we didn't have Jordan Love on the team and we had no other options, I would say we need to get rid of Aaron Rodgers and trade him for some pieces and then see if we can get some kind of a, a veteran out there for like a one-year stopgap or something that, that we're not handcuffed to and isn't going to absolutely obliterate our salary cap in 2024 if we keep them, you know, find a different option um, until we can draft a quarterback. That would be my course of action. It's not about Jordan Love. It's not about winning. It's not about any of that. It's about looking at the data in front of me that's telling me as plainly as it could possibly tell me, you have to run, flee, hide from Aaron Rodgers this year. He cannot play here. Cannot. And that sucks that we put ourselves in this situation. And by the way, for everybody that's ticked off and wants Rodgers to stay, the reason he can't stay is because of the contract that he requires to be here. He didn't need that contract with those big numbers. He didn't need that. And if he had taken a smaller contract with smaller numbers, he'd be playing this year with no dispute, no problems, nothing. 
So I don't even want to hear it about Aaron Rodgers. He absolutely could have taken a smaller contract that didn't require this much pain on the salary cap. But that's the contract that he demanded, so that's the contract that he got, and now he has to go. Has to. Period. Anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. Tomorrow, it wasn't really my plan, but all this stuff is just flying through my head right now. I want to talk tomorrow a lot about quarterback and not Aaron Rodgers, although we'll probably touch on it a little bit with the Pat McAfee thing because he absolutely obliterated Ian and Schefter, which he was you know, polite about it, but at the same time, stop effing saying things that aren't true. And um, it basically went on a diatribe that I, th- I thought I was listening to the Packernet podcast when I was listening to Rodgers today, and it made me happy. So I'll probably just play a bunch of that. But anyways, love you guys. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye. Bye.